Welcome to the Boone County History and Cultural Centers Meet the Author Program. I'm David Weber. I'm looking forward to our in-person meetings on the third Saturday of each month after COVID has left us. Until then, we'll be doing Zoom interviews, uh, which will go live on YouTube the third Saturday of each month. I want to thank Simmons Bank and the staff of the History and Cultural Center for making this interview possible. Our goal is to present authors from Mid-Missouri, authors who know a lot about Missouri. If you have any suggestions of authors that you'd like to see, please email me at the History and Cultural Center or at the University of Missouri. Our guest today is Professor Waldo Johnson of Harvard University. He is the Winthrop Professor of History and Professor of African and Af African and African American Studies. He has three highly regarded books. One is Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market that was published in 1999. The second book was River of Dark Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Cotton Kingdom, which came out in 2013. And both of these books have received almost all of the history um, prizes that are available. The last May, he, uh, his third book, The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States. So this is the book that we will be mostly talking about today. So uh, Professor Johnson, Walter Johnson, um, not only knows a lot about Missouri, but he is from Missouri. Welcome, Walter. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me take a minute and explain uh, how I first learned about you and why I followed your career more than you might think. Um, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area, but for some reason, St. Louis has always been uh, in my mind. It could have been Stan Usual, could have been the Arch, I'm not sure. But when I, um, one of my uncles heard I was coming to the University of Missouri, he was quite pleased because he had gone through Union Station several times during World War II. Uh -huh. And he uh, told me that, it, that St. Louis is the center of the country and, it, and that that's where the capital should be. Uh, I came to the political science department at the University of Missouri in 1986 and we shared a building with the Department of Economics. So about the third day I was in town, I was exhausted and I'm going out to lunch by myself and I bump into this man who uh, knew I was new and he asked me where I was from and I gave him the story and stuff. And he asked me where I was going to live. And I told him we had bought a house on Edgewood Avenue and I gave him all the details and he said, well, that's the street to live on. That's the best street in town. Et cetera, et cetera. And of course, a couple of minutes later, I asked him, well, where do you live? And he said, Edgewood Avenue. Uh, and then he told me about his two sons. So I guess by 1986, you had left Columbia? Yeah, right. I, I went to, I graduated from high school in 1984. In the spring thought, of 1984, yeah. Um, and then when I looked, uh, so because of your father and then later your mother, Mary Angela, who I got to know, and I was on the board of um, board of trustees of the public library, as right. she was. Uh, right. but, but we didn't overlap, unfortunately. Um, uh, but when I went to your website last uh, Mar March, I, I knew about this book uh, coming out, and I was very impressed that your third uh, 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 that your first sentence, but the third phrase is that you've been uh, inducted into the Rockbridge High School Hall of Fame in 2008. So I guess my first question for you, Walter, is what was it like growing up in Columbia back then? Uh, did that have any part in you uh, becoming a Harvard University professor? <laughs> well, well, I mean, first we got to, I, I think I was inducted in the Hall of Fame in 2006. And that's, uh, that's, that's important to me because that was the same year as uh, Carl Edwards, the NASCAR driver. So oh. That's the, the kind of credibility that I'm seeking with that. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, with that that mm -hmm. title. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that growing up in Colombia has shaped my intellectual and ethical life in in ways untold and probably ways that I haven't completely figured out. Um, I was struck uh, when you were talking about my father, you know, who it's it's very nice to, to have remembered. Um, I was struck by his focus on, you know, on the neighborhood. And of course, a lot of what I try to grapple with in the broken heart of America is the way that that neighborhoods um, mask certain kinds of deeper historical um, inequity and, and the way that the, the notion of the good neighborhood is a way that, that racism and white supremacy are, are structured into space. And so I think that part of what I have over the course of my life and particularly over the course of this book is tried to, to come to terms with and not I, I think in, in ad, any way that, that I would say was adequate to atonement, but just with a, a sort of a kind of a self-knowledge about, about the history that, that shaped me. Um, you know, I, I also, um, I'm, I'm deeply attached to Missouri and, and to Columbia. And so I remember, I remember those places, um, you know, angrily, because of, of the things that I saw and, and witnessed, by stood, allowed to happen, participated in, but also um, with a, with a lot of a lot of love. And so I think that you know, at some point I had to redo my my website, and, and I had read somewhere that you should put you know you should try to to put things in an order that. It makes sense, help somebody make sense of who you think you are. <laughs> well, I, you know, I guess I, I still think that I'm, I'm from Columbia. You know, mm. people, people there might not want me around anymore. You know, so that's, that's um, what I think of myself. Were you familiar with the major history of Columbia? Like, for example, um, and I'm jumping ahead a lot. Did, uh, did you know about Sharp End, for example? No, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I was familiar with it to the extent that I was living through it and to the, um, you know, and, and it was, it was visible in, in all kinds of ways. I mean, I was just thinking, you know, right before we started talking, I was thinking about Edgewood, which as you know, the name of Edgewood changes in Broadway, right? Changes to Aldea. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. I was thinking about the very, very, you know, it was impossible even as a small child not to recognize the bounded character of black life in Colombia. Um, and, and so I think that, that there are ways that a lot of those things I, I understood I could see without really understanding them historically and gradually I could um, understand them, you know, politically to a certain extent. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think, I think historically, but no, Sharpen, I don't know about. Yeah. Um, what, um, and then, uh, how did you become interested in history? Did you expect to end up studying history and getting a PhD and all that stuff? Well, no, you know, about? I mean, I, I think probably, um, I think at some point, you know, I, I guess I've always had a weakness for wanting to talk a lot and use big words and, and tell people what to do. So, you know, at some point I thought I should probably be a minister, but I wasn't really holy enough. And so that, that left me. <laughs> and then, then I kind of wanted to write essays, you know, just to write essays and tell people what to do or tell them, you know, different things I had seen or thought about. And, um, but that didn't seem, I, I, didn't, I didn't recognize or know the pathway to be allowed to do that. And, um, you know, of course, I had grown up at Mizzou with my father being a, a professor and, um, so that was something I fell into fairly comfortably. Now, you know, he was very, very um, insistent that I study economics 
and from a you know <laughs> from a fairly early age i had a little bit freer spirit than that might have allowed so that you know that was a kind of a, a negotiation that took place between us and then and i really wanted to study well at some point i wanted to study american studies which is more or less the sort of work that i do now um but my father was you know, kind of dogmatically disciplinary in, in the university sense. So, you know, American studies for him was, I mean, you know, it was, it was like, what's that? That's nothing. You know, I mean, I remember well, saying, I, I actually got a very similar response from him about about sociology. So, you can't say, oh, well, yeah, he was, he was pretty, um, he, he was, he, he was not uh, irenic well, in his approach to other disciplines. Well, so I think, well, I think that's a common academic yeah. error. And yeah. I think there is a pecking order in the social sciences. Economics is about political science, my right. discipline. But fortunately, we have sociology to look yeah, down upon. Go. So there everything's you fine. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, I, I went to college. You know, what what I what I hit on, what I like, I, I had always liked to read. I like to read fiction, and so I wanted to be an English major. And I I encountered at Amherst College where I went um, somebody who who I won't name, but who who I hope he's listening because this this man actually refused to teach me. And I was teaching a 20th century British poetry class and I went in there and I just I couldn't understand meter. You know, I, I actually think that I have some kind of kind of intellectual disability because if you if you say a long word and ask me how many syllables are in the word, yeah. I can't tell you. I can't scan yeah. stuff. Yeah. This guy refused to explain it to me though. And so that was the end of my career as a as an English major and I kind of fell into history that way. So not out of any sort of love of history. I'm not one of these people who was you know, with, with all due respect to the to the Blue County Historical Society and its successful organizations, I'm not one of these people who loved history as a, as a child. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I've, I've viewed like the, the field trips to Arrow Rock, for yeah. instance. I really, well, you know, I was one of the people who was most obsessed with rock candy rather than yeah. you know, the history yeah. of, of Central Missouri. Yeah. Were you interested in politics? I mean, do you know about um, elections and campaigns? You and know, stuff? I, I, I've been thinking about that recently. I was interested in the things that I still consider to be politics, like the things that I'm most fundamentally into about um, mutual aid, about different kinds of dissidents, about, cre you know, creative expression. I've always been really interested in that. I was not as taken with, I think it's probably fair to say, I was not as taken with electoral or municipal politics as any member of my family, <laughs> including, mm, my, including my my brother, who I remember campaigning for, for Steve Gardner against Wendell Bailey in what must have been about, oh, wow. you know, 1980, 1982, I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. So, and, and I think that followed through, you know, I remember always being a little bit, um, feeling a little bit sort of unable, not having enough information to really engage with the, you know, the political jocks in college or, or in graduate mm. school. Um, but it, it's only now that I recognize that, that I had a different kind of, a, a different frame for, for what, you know, for what I would now call, call politics. Yeah. No, um, one thing that I think I've seen in your three books is how you've gone. I mean, certainly the first one is person to person, you know, soul to soul, right. very, uh, very micro, micro, and then you've moved out to more societal forces. Um, Absolutely, that's that's been a kind of a journey of mine, an intellectual yeah. journey, uh, more towards um, you know, more towards a lar larger scale set of questions more towards a um, more, I guess, forthright reckoning with, with political economy, systems of political economy, more mm -hmm. towards um, a certain kind of Marxism um, mm -hmm. inflected with uh, what I would call the black radical tradition. Um, and, and then finally, in, in, this, mm -hmm. in this book, you know, really, really back to the kinds of 
um, you municipal politics that I grew up around, you know, that my parents were involved in, my friend's parents were involved in, that they talked about all the time. You know, I, I occasionally um, think of my, my father who was, um, you know, if, if, I mean, if I had written the book about St. Louis, um, my father would have been one of the villains of the book. Right, and and that that helps me, that helps me think think of you know remember to think of people in a trying to think of them in a in a in a loving way. If I, I said if I had written the book, you know, because he was in the my father was a member of the Industrial Development Authority, which and was the Boone the, Hospital, the Boone Hospital, and Motor you know, yeah. his his work at Boone Hospital ended with the with the privatization, the sale of a public high school hospital to a private company. And so, you know, I, I think that, the, and we, we differed politically for a long time. Um, and that doesn't, you know, that doesn't diminish the, the affection that I have for him or yeah. for memories of Columbia, but it, it does, um, it, it was helpful to me. And, you know, it doesn't always come through my prose because I remain a kind of a Old Testament preacher at heart, but it helps me remember um, the, the complexity of of people's um, lives. Yeah. And then, so uh, then let's talk about this book. So it yeah. covers a broad range, right? I mean, you said from Lewis and Clark up until Ferguson. And one thing that I um, appreciate and that I will remember from it, and um, I would like you to discuss is the parallels between Native American removal and slavery. I guess the parallels mm -hmm. um, and differences, actually. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I'd never thought of that before. And that St. Louis was really the center of, with the Jefferson Barracks and the home of the military or the army, that it was a central force, I guess, for uh -huh. Indian removal. Well, um, yeah, what I'm, what I'm trying to do in that part of the book is, is talk, to talk really about interlinkages. And, you know, a lot of what is in my second book is um, the story of the building of what people came to call the Cotton Kingdom, of the, the Deep South Cotton uh, Plantation Complex in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And of course, in, you know, even as late as, as 1830, Mississippi was mostly Choctaw, right? And this, this whole, that whole plantation complex there was built on, on land that was Creek, it was Chickasaw, it was Choctaw. Yeah. It was uh, Seminole, Cherokee, Cato. And so, um, you know, so that book very much began a kind of an intellectual process for me about thinking of the interlinkage of um, imperial um, expropriation and indeed an extermination and the spread of what I call racial capitalism. Missouri, you know, when I started to look at St. Louis, St. Louis looked a little bit different in the sense that um, what, what struck me as I began to study it was that the, the, the sort of um, removalist attitude towards Native Americans actually carried over to African Americans. So there was a desire not uh, among many people, not all, but particularly among non-slaveholding white people to simply get rid of yeah. black people to, to, to exclude slavery and also to exclude free black people. And so what I saw there was um, a kind of a, a generalization of the notion of, of the white man's country, a generalization of the sort of imperial attitude towards land and race and, and um, Native Americans and, and extermination and removal. And so that that I think in a way became part of the heart of the book, which is, is focusing on the relationship between the history of empire and the history of a particular, what I, what I think of as a, as a particularly kind of Western strand of anti-blackness. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I had never thought or realized that in the South, uh, you say that slavery was about, uh, it needed reproduction yeah. of slaves. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, as opposed to Western view, which is to move them on out 
Exactly. That, yeah. that, that, so, so at the at the heart of the question then yeah. is, is a question about about gender, sexuality, and what I would call social reproduction, the, the, mm -hmm. the reproduction of a class system or an economic system over time. Mm -hmm. And in the South, the, the reproduction of the of slaveholding society depends upon the biological reproduction mm -hmm. of enslaved people. Yeah. Well, that's and, and so slaveholders their their racism is configured around that fact and that's not to say it's better or worse it is uh, it is um morally unsustainable it's infinitely morally bad in the west the, it's infinitely morally bad in a different way mm -hmm. which is that the the reproduction of african americans the reproduction of black humanity over time is seen as threatening to the social order the social order it, it far from depending on it the, the social order order um is seen by many as depending upon the excision yeah. of african americans from the polity and i see that as a um, a removalist and even a genocidal impulse. And I, I try to trace then the way that the history of St. Louis, um, you know, that there's a series of removals that, that frame uh, the arc of the book. And what, um, I guess why I thought of Columbia's sharp end, mm -hmm. is, uh, I, I, I think it's called, uh, is it Mill Creek Valley? Mm -hmm. Mill Creek Valley? which right. was about the same time. I mean, it was in the 50s that it was, uh, uh, people needed to be moved out. I think you said mm -hmm. 5,000 acres, 20,000 people were relocated. Yeah, 20,000 people, that's right, yep. Uh, uh, in, the where, in, the, in 1959, yeah. Where was, it, where exactly in, in Columbia was Sharp End? Is that right? Uh, uh, behind Douglas High School, uh, okay. the post office. Um, oh, all right, all right, where the yeah. city building is and the police station all the way up to the And the Tribune, house. yes, sir. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't that long. I mean, you know, it's a oh, hundred, oh, probably, oh, at least 25 Black-owned businesses, mm -hmm. barber shops, grocery stores, doctors, um, and I don't, I'm not sure how many individuals, but... Um, <laughs> At about the same time, and probably funded by the federal, you know, urban redevelopment money, right. and, you know. Um, but what um, you see, um, you seem to see that in St. Louis, you saw that uh, the the, uh, the politics of the 1950s as a continuation of like the labor labor strikes in St. Louis that you. Um, well, I, I think I, I see it, yeah, as as a as a continuation and a reaction. So I think that I see um, in the history of the massive sort of teardowns, urban redevelopment by destruction, redevelopment by bulldozer. You know that starts in St. Louis in in 1939 with the riverfront. And I see in that both a, both a kind of a, a, an aggressive retaliation against the, the far left in St. Louis, the communist and black far left, because that's really where a lot of those, those folks were, were located, as well as the beginning of real estate focused capitalism. In St. Louis, and so I, I see that you know, but basically yeah, the idea was yeah. by by tearing down a whole bunch of square feet, you revalue, you raise the value of the remaining square footage, while also buying people out, right? So you buy a bunch of the the real the landlords out, and you raise everybody else's um, property values. And I think that continues, you know, all the way certainly through Mill Creek Valley and 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 after. There's a um, there's a complicated relationship between the um, urban renewal by bulldozer and and the labor movement in the sense that there is particularly after the Second World War a tremendous amount of anxiety about what sorts of jobs are going to be available for returning soldiers, for the returning white soldiers. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I argue in the book is that these massive infrastructural projects, um, 
the interstate highway system, these big urban mm -hmm. development programs, the, the channelization of the, the Missouri River through the Missouri River Valley Authority. Um, all these, these projects were created with the idea of employing post-military um, demobilized mm -hmm. whites exactly. and sort of reintegrating them into society as um, eventually as suburban homeowners. And so I see all those things then of a, of a piece with the federal support of the, um, the interstate highways, but also with, you know, suburbanization as a kind of a way to, to build um, a new sort of white life, a reintegrative domestic white life in the United States, um, literally over the top in many instances of, of African American you know, and do you think that, uh, was there um, a longer history of um, civil rights activism? For example, oh, uh, I remember you saying in your book that uh, even uh, the the lunch counter uh -huh. sit-ins may have started in St. Louis yeah. before they started yeah. in North Carolina or Tennessee, wherever it yep, was. Yeah, yep, North Carolina. Yeah, so I, th I th there was a long history in St. Louis, and there was a very long far left history, radical working class history dating back to the Civil War and the, you know, the, the communist generals and, and officers in the Union Army and the, their alliance with um, enslaved people who had emancipated themselves and, and, and come to the city. Um, so I try and start that that story really there and follow that set of, you know, I, I mean, images of that alliance through the general strike, St. Louis Commune of 1877 and through the uh, through the unemployed councils and the, and the Funston nut strike and other kinds of alliances between African-American and communists in the 30s. One story that I think is not, it, well, what, something that I don't deal with in the book in as much detail as I wish I, I had now, but you know, I just didn't, I didn't have the time or the space to do it, or I chose not to, I mean, I can't blame anybody else, um, is, is what you're talking about, which is the, um, the way that out of the Civil War, St. Louis emerged as a place with, and, and the state of Missouri, a place where there was actually publicly funded education for African Americans. That was a very, very successful struggle, successful Civil War reconstruction. Um, James Milton Turner is the name most often associated with that in Missouri. And, and so in St. Louis, from a fairly early period, there is an emerging class of educated African American people who, after the 15th Amendment, are able to exercise the right to vote. And the kind of massive disenfranchisement that occurred in the in the deeper South never really happened in St. Louis. Is that and right? So yeah, so there's a foundation for black middle class um, political power in in St. Louis that I I, I show a lot of I, I I think I show a lot of the the incidents the episodes of that, but the the major story that I'm telling is really focused on black and white working class people's resistant politics. And there is that the other aspect that I think is, you know, um, part of that is the lunch counter sit-ins in the 40s. And, and part of that are the, the different um, civil rights cases, you know, Lloyd versus uh, Gaines versus Canada yeah. Yeah. and yeah. Um, Meyer versus Jones and yeah. that, that come out of, of St. Louis. The housing versus, policy. Shelley versus housing. Kramer, right? Yeah. 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 So important. Yeah. 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 And what do you think about about politics? I mean, uh, I believe this St. Louis City Council is quite large. Yes, it is. 30 right. members. Did yeah. it have uh, blacks elected to it? Back then, or yeah, the, I mean, there's there has for a long time been African American aldermen in St. Louis. I couldn't tell you exactly who sure. the first African American huh. alderman was, and um, I think that um, it, it hasn't the the, the 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 board of aldermen in St. Louis has not always um, been the most radical side of black politics in, in the city. You know, it, it has occasionally, um, but it hasn't always been.
Yeah. And then what um, what about other institutions uh, like Washington University, St. Louis University? Were they uh, obstacles towards uh, uh, increased welfare for uh, well, so, so, you know, yeah, I mean, the, I'm, a, I'm a, obviously a, a university person. Sure, um, sure. So yeah. part of the problem with universities in cities is that universities address the ills of the world um, while at the same time often exacerbating the ills of the communities in which yeah. they reside. And, and, you know, that begins with the, the nonprofit status and the fact that they don't pay taxes. But, mm -hmm. you know, they own a lot of real estate. They employ people at, um, in sometimes poor conditions. Certainly, you know, St. Louis University has a complicated history with slavery, as does the, the institution at which I teach. Um, St. Louis University was built out into a lot of, of the Mill Creek Valley right. demolition. Um, Washington University, you know, I mean, it was, I think, a, a real node of the, um, the military industrial university complex of the 1960s. I mean, I think as much as Stanford, Chicago, WashU were probably the three. And so, yeah, the, so, so the institutions have have dark histories. Now, I, I don't say, I don't want it to be heard to be saying that moralistically. I mean, because, you know, there, there's no institution that has a darker history than the one that I work for. And so, so I, I say that, um, you know, lovingly in, in, in a sense that, that they, they have a lot to answer for as does Harvard and and I, my, you know, as the, the folks who I know at those institutions are, um, very, very committed to, to recognizing that, being transparent about that, and, and trying to set about making things better in the city. Well, well, um, so uh, I read that one of your interests now is with the Commonwealth Project. Mm -hmm. How is that? Um, is that um, yeah, so so the the Commonwealth Project uh, during COVID or is it going on now? Or well, it... no, I mean, yeah, we we have some things going on. I mean, we so it's it's a, something that grew out of a collaboration with um, Tefco, who's a, a St. Louis-based artist and activist. Who? How did you meet him? Um, I asked him. Well, I was, I guess I was. I didn't getting, know about him. Yeah, you know, I started out a lot. I guess in the fall of two thousand fourteen. I started out with the St. Louis Project um, because I got invited to give a talk at WashU, and I felt like I couldn't go to St. Louis without talking about Ferguson. So I started yeah. investigating the political economy of Ferguson. And one of the things that I started to try to do, but then quickly abandoned, was to look at videos of all of the city council meetings and all of the, the um, St. Louis County meetings to try and you know find people talking about tax abatements and i just i turned on one of these meetings i think maybe it was a county meeting a video and there was this young man who was just reading them i mean i i, I would say the, the metaphor we have is reading them the riot act but he was yeah, doing sure. exactly yeah. the opposite right mm -hmm. um yeah. and so and and he you know, he was extraordinarily insightful and eloquent, and I thought, well, I I want to, I want to bring that energy to to Harvard, so you know, so the students here can understand what's happening mm -hmm. in St. Louis, which I was mm -hmm. increasingly obsessed with. And so I invited him to come, and he gave a fantastic talk, and we became, you know, sort of friends then, and then then collaborated and stayed in touch, and eventually. Um, he came for a year to a center that, that I, at that point, directed at Harvard as what we call an American Democracy Fellow, which is a fellowship for activists to come and, and sort of help ventilate the university with, with frontline knowledge. Sure. Um, and over that year, and then the next year that he spent at a different center at Harvard, we talked a lot and sort of started to scheme about different things that we thought you could do with a small amount of money in St. Louis. And that was the, the, the germinus of the, mm. the Commonwealth Project. Um, turned out that, that we needed 
more than a small amount of money to do the things that we wanted and still want to do. And so one of the things that I did was to try to get Harvard involved by getting Harvard students involved in St. Louis. Yeah. And um, largely at first through a collaboration with the Equal Housing Opportunity Council um, and working on um, their legal case in Centerville, Illinois, which is on the east side um, near East St. Louis, mm -hmm. where the people are living with a mm -hmm. terrible, terrible um, sort of stormwater um, flooding sewer problem where the stormwater comes, floods uh, everything, you know, even in a, in a moderate storm. And um, because the, the sewer infrastructure is decaying, that water becomes mixed up with the sewer water. And so it's a kind of a toxic flood. So EHOC, the Equal Housing Opportunity Council, and then a, another organization called Equity Legal Services, um, were people who I came to know through a different set of academic activist connections. And they were really interested in having Harvard students come. So we made that connection. It honestly began um, somewhat cynically on my part in the sense that my main goal was to try to use, <laughs> use Harvard students effectively to launder money to, sure. you know, we we'll have to kind of keep this on the down low, to do work in St. Louis that I thought was important work. The students were so fantastic. And, and I don't just mean for EHOC, although they were fantastic for EHOC, um, they were fantastic people who um, developed deep relationships with people in St. Louis, but also grew um, with one another in a way that, that I found inspiring and beautiful. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in spite of, you know, the fact that I had sort of gone about this in this backdoor way, that became a real commitment of mine to those, to that group of students, and then to trying to, um, I guess, recapture that with other subsequent groups. And so now we've, we've got several, that, that's an ongoing project where, where students work in, in St. Louis over the summer. And we've developed over the last year, we had a, a program going um, where we uh, gave a modest fellowship to six artists in St. Louis who were gonna do an exhibit at the Griot Museum in North St. Louis, the Griot Museum of Black History and Culture, and then um, bring that exhibit to Harvard. And it involved several layers of exchange between Harvard students and, and artists. That particular project got blown up by COVID. So we, we, were never, we were never able to open the exhibit at the Griot. Um, and we're trying now to, to pick up the pieces and to, to maybe do an online exhibit. Yeah. What, um, do you have a fourth book in mind? Uh, I do. Um, well, big oh, that's, it's, it's more in mind than anything now. You know, I've, I've had oh, a hard time yeah. getting much work done over the, over the COVID period because I have, yeah. a, I mean, I have a, all kinds of kids, but I have a, the youngest is eight. And so, you know, he's been at home. But yeah, I'm going to try and write a book of uh, a biography of John Brown. So the anti oh, really? huh. yeah, the anti slavery huh. revolutionary. Huh. Um, he's long been a, uh, I guess, a hero of mine. And, and so, and then, you know, um, and I want to try to deal with, you know, try and figure out around the edges of the story. I mean, really focusing on the question of empire again. Well, how, how, do, how does John Brown fit into the question of the United States empire? You know, how does, how does he fit into the, the question of Native American politics? And also to try and think a little bit more about his um, political economic vision than I think passes so and so, because there's a very strong strand of, of collectivism in, in John Brown's thought. And so yeah. to, to just, just think about that. No, I don't know much about him. I mean, I guess he spent a lot of time in Kansas, right? He did spend a lot of time in Kansas. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's I'm, all that I, I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. You know, it's it is. Um, and that's been a learning process for me too, because of course I was really brought up to, and I am still a pretty fierce um, Tiger fan, and so it's you know it's been it's taken a little bit of reckoning for me to to reimagine the the border war as something where I'm actually identified with the participants in Lawrence rather than those coming over the border yeah. from Missouri. Yeah. Huh? Uh, 
Very good. Uh, I'm trying to think. Is, let me see if there's any other questions I wanted to. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I guess maybe uh, go back to structure for uh, yeah. a minute as a political scientist. Well, well um, would life have been different if the city had expanded into the county? As has happened in other in, places. In, it, so, if if the, if there was not a hard boundary between the city and county in St. Louis, and the city was yeah. able to annex areas to annex. Yeah. of the county, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that on the whole, the the inequality would be slightly less drastic mm -hmm. um, between the city and county. I don't, however, think that the city county divide is the um, the original sin of St. Louis. I think that imperialism and anti anti blackness, racial capitalism is the original sin of in St. Louis just as it is in the in the United States and that yeah. that um, the the inequality and and the violence um, follow follow that arc of history, the, the arc of the history of racial capitalism rather than, than the arc of history of municipal government. But you know obviously the, the city county divide doesn't doesn't help anything. And you know one way that, that people sometimes you know people sometimes want me to have lots of ideas about well what what, what could be done. Well you know a, a, a very a modest, although at this point unimaginable, first step would be to, to set up a unified school district, right? A, unit, exactly. a, city, a city county unified school district would yeah. be a, a first step yeah. that would take, I mean, these, these public schools, I mean, you know, I teach the kids who, who come out of Clayton and Ladue public That's schools right. and they're, right. they're, they're fantastic. They're fantastically yeah. educated. They've seen the world. And so to try to, to begin to, to spread some of that, that resource around the, the metro area would be, a, you know, an easy first step. I mean, easy, you know, easy in the sense that it's, it's a basic reform, difficult politically. So do many of these students involved in a Commonwealth project do they end up writing dissertations on St. Louis? I mean, that would be a, a, um, a, a, a yeah. It's, so it's a fantastic. It's, topic. Yeah, it's it's undergraduates, so not not so much dissertations, but I oh, have um, so you no. Know, a, a couple of them have have really stayed active in St. Louis, and um, there's one. Yeah, they're all terrific. One of the many terrific students has taken a semester off from Harvard. You know, Harvard right now is is completely remote. 40% of the students are on campus. Yeah. And some of the, yeah. the kids, a lot of the kids just didn't want to deal with that. And so this particular student has taken a, a semester off and is um, working, you know, full time for, for EHOP, for the Equal Housing Opportunity mm -hmm. Council, working on, on um, evictions and tenants' rights. And so, you know, I, I do hope that um, one of the things that happens is that these talented, you know, wonderful, justice loving young people um, go and they live for a summer in St. Louis and they love it, you know, and just like I love St. Louis, I love being there. Um, I don't, you know, I don't love everything about it, but it's, yeah. a, it's an amazing, vibrant city and that they, that they, they get bit by that and, and want to go and you know, work there. Yeah, huh? very good. Well, um, we've used up our, our, a lot of time for the recording, I know. Um, and um, I enjoyed all three books. Uh, I'm more knowledgeable hey. about one and three than I am two. <laughs> but I'm, uh, and it's only, um, um, it's good to see that you are doing well even that yeah. I followed your father and mother's activities for so long. No, I, I really appreciate the, the invitation and I, I, I appreciate the, the connection to, you know, to my parents and also the, I'm, I'm still sort of reeling from the information about Sharp Sound. I think, I think, you know, to be honest with you, I think part of um, leaving Missouri and part of the difficulty of going back to write about St. Louis was just having to really directly confront those things. And I haven't actually really directly confronted the history of, of Columbia. Um, and so that's, um, I'm still, I'm still thinking about that. I'm really grateful to you for that, that piece of history.